I'd like to welcome to the stage Ambassador Robert Tuttle and Dr. Condoleezza Rice. Good evening and uh, welcome. Um, I'm just delighted to welcome back Secretary Rice to the Pacific Council. Um, I'm sure many of you in this room were here in 2011 when she spoke uh, to our biennial gala. And she gave, excuse my language, but one hell of a speech. <laughs> and what I remember besides the speech, uh, Madam Secretary, is that uh, several of our prominent Democratic members came up to me afterwards and said, if she runs, I'm for, even if she runs as a Republican. <laughs> um, and, and I agree, uh, you would be the perfect candidate. But uh, tonight, we're not here to talk about uh, uh, running for office. Um, we're here about the opportunity to question and talk to Secretary Rice about her new book, Democracy. Um, it is a subject that she is passionate about. Um, and I'm not going to bore you with a lot of a long introduction, but let me read one of the quotes from her book. It's very short. Dem democratic institutions are the best hope for humankind. Um, and if, if I'm allowed a little personal comments, I'm too passionate about democracy. Um, after World War, World War II, there were about 12 democracies. You can correct me on that. Today, there are over 100. And I think that eightfold increase since 1945 has a lot to do with the tremendous increase in standards of living and uh, really uh, mortality around the world. And it's not just been in, in Western Europe, it's been throughout the world, which I'm sure you're gonna talk about. So I'm gonna start with some questions, but I guarantee you I will leave time for uh, questions for the rest of you. So let me start. Um, could we could we just do one thing first? Yes, yes, ma'am. I won't call you ambassador. No, you that's don't right. Call me secretary. Okay. okay, all right, so. Condi. All right. All right. Bob Condi. Okay. Okay. okay, all right. I always say that ambassadors are like fish. They former ambassadors are like fish. They stink after three days. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, Rock. We've got a few out there. <laughs> a, a theme you discuss in your book is that young democracies are incredibly fragile. And what should the United States and those who share our values do um, to help those undergoing that transition to democracy? Well, first of all, it's great to be here at the Pacific Council. It's a great organization, and thanks for inviting me to talk about democracy. You know, it's a, it is a very important time. I, I do want to say I didn't think that I would be sort of dropping this book into this particular environment. I, uh, <laughs> I started this book more than three years ago, but uh, it is what it is. But uh, so the first thing that we have to do is that we need to help countries that are trying to find their way to democracy uh, to work on issues of institutional design. One thing that I try to do in the book is to talk about how the American founding fathers thought about institutions. They were people who worried a great deal about how institutions would relate to one another. So they knew instinctively and from their experiences with the, the British that a too strong executive was a problem. So they very much constrained the American presidency by putting two houses of Congress as a separate branch of government, separate and equal, and in fact made an Article I not Article Two. They created courts that could check the power of the president. They created federalism so that you had states. Uh, and then they created, of course, room for civil society where government wouldn't enter. They uh, advocated for a free press. And uh, they put it all together in a remarkable thing called the American Constitution. And it has been evergreen. Mm. Now, when people around the world are looking for uh, a good design, uh, I don't say, you know, you should, it should look like the American Constitution, but it should at least have those basic elements. You cannot have too strong an executive or you're going to get an authoritarian. You must have a free press. People have the right to associate freely. Uh, you need an independent judiciary. And so those are some of the elements that we can help countries to, to deal with. But the most important thing that we can do is be patient. I'm always struck by how impatient we are with people who are just making those first steps toward democracy. And of all the people who should be 
patient, it's Americans, because it took us quite a while to get it right. Uh, the United States of America was founded with a birth defect. That would be slavery. And uh, I have been saying to people, if you haven't been to the African American Museum in Washington, D.C., you really must go. It's, it's remarkable. And it's been beautifully curated by Lonnie Bunch Lonnie and Bunch. Uh, a number of African American historians. But there is one display that to me was just absolutely chilling. And it had a very large bronze statue of Thomas Jefferson. And behind him were bricks with the names of his slaves. And that was America's contradiction. The high-minded rhetoric of equality for all and yet born as a slaveholding uh, state. And so if you look at the tremendous journey that we've made using this amazing constitution to the point that descendants of slaves would find their rights through the same American constitution that once counted them as three-fifths of a man, you have to have patience to get to that mystical place where people trust institutions to, for change, they trust institutions to carry out their interests rather than the street or their family or their clan or their religion. So there's a lot that we can do in terms of design and voting and so forth, but patience may be the most important Born thing day. we can do. And boy, do I agree with what Condi said about going to the African American Museum. Uh, lie, steet, and shield uh, to get a ch ticket. It's tough to get a ticket. I've been a couple of times. It's unbelievable. Um, it's a great museum. Uh, could you give us some examples of uh, relatively recent successful transitions to democracy? Well, we have had several. Uh, we had a very successful set of transitions to democracy after the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, the countries of the Eastern Bloc made a relatively smooth transition. The Czech Republic, Slovakia, the three Baltic states, uh, Poland, although Poland is experiencing a little bit of, uh, of uh, well. Retrograde. I wouldn't call it retrogression. I was just okay. about to say that. Sorry, uh, sorry. <laughs> challenges to its democracy, let's call it that. But when you look at countries that were under communist rule, and you look just a few years later, and they are electing parliaments and electing presidents, and people have free speech, you say that's a pretty remarkable transition to democracy. And one of the most amazing of them, Poland, the United States played a very interesting role, and I talk about it in the book. So when martial law was declared in Poland in December of 1980, uh, solidarity, the labor union, was uh, declared illegal and uh, people were rounded up. Lane Kirkland of the AFL-CIO, Ronald Reagan through the CIA, and Pope John Paul II through the Vatican kept solidarity alive. They would give them things, not lethally, they would give them things like printing presses so that underground they could continue to print their literature. Uh, the Pope would go to Poland and he would hold these rallies and the, the communists didn't quite know what to do about it. So this was a really good example again of the West helping and intervening in what became one of the best transitions to democracy. Uh, you have other cases um, and sometimes it's just a little thing that happens. So Nigeria. Uh, when, when I went with President Bush to Nigeria, we went into the President's office and they had the portraits of the former presidents, and with one exception, they were all military. Now, they just had an election last year. This is the continent where president for life got coined as a term. And when, uh, when good luck Jonathan lost, he called his, his uh, opponent, and he said, you've won the election, I concede, and I'm there to help support you. Those moments are really quite remarkable because they say that countries are maturing. Now, there have been plenty that have gone the other way, but we have to celebrate the ones that are actually succeeding. Right. Uh, should we send the Pope to Moscow? <laughs> I mean, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> yeah, there's a little problem between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Catholics. So that's a little bit of a problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Freedom House has talked about the decline of democracy in recent years. First, do you agree? And if so, would you share with us uh, some remedies that yeah. you would perhaps propose? Uh, I actually don't agree. Uh, look, I have enormous respect for Freedom House, and if you look at their data, it would support it. But I think that one of the reasons that we 
are talking about democracy and recession, the decline of democracy, is that uh, we sort of expected a straight line. After the Soviet Union collapsed and it looked like things were moving very, very much that way and then you had the Arab Spring and it looked like, and we, we thought that it was always going to be a straight line and democracy is never a straight line. You know, you move along, I think it's more like climbing a steep staircase. You climb for a little while, you stop on the landing, you catch your breath, you consolidate and you move forward again. And so I think the disappointment that there have been some reversals uh, that it's not been as uh, straight as we had straight line as we thought. I think that's one reason people are talking about uh, the 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 recession of democracy or the decline of democracy. Interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting. Uh, many many people argue, and I've certainly experienced this, that there are places on the on this great planet where uh, democracy cannot survive. Yeah. Maybe the Middle East. Again, I'd ask you if you would agree, and if not, what is your counter-argument? Yeah, and uh, Bob, I know you don't agree with this, so I'm going to caricature <laughs> I this don't. argument for a second. Mm -hmm. This argument is those people aren't ready for democracy. Exactly. Right? And it's, it's usually said by people who have the benefit of living in a democracy. I agree. <laughs> or those Thank people you. don't want democracy, said by people who have the security of the rights that we have. And so I find it patronizing beyond belief. And, and it's often, it's this cultural argument. Right? So when political scientists can't figure out how to explain something, their residual category is culture. Right? It must be culture. So uh, Asians were to Confucian. Well, there are now a bunch of Asian democracies. Um, Africans were too tribal. Well, now there are a bunch of, tri of African democracies. Well, Latin Americans, well, they preferred cadillos and men on horseback, uh, you know, the, the military coups that uh, they kept experiencing. Well, now there are a whole bunch of Latin American democracies. Uh, Germans, by the way, were once too martial. They just obeyed orders. Well, uh, they've done pretty well with democracy yeah. in Germany. And of course, uh, blacks, the descendants of slaves, well, well, they were too childlike to care about those things like the vote. Now, the only place that it is, quote, legitimate to say this about any longer is the Middle East. Because uh, every place else has demonstrated that there's no DNA that's somehow defective about democracy. But in the Middle East, it is true that the problems are complicated. And they're complicated by the marriage of politics and religion. Uh, I think generally uh, one of the things that the American Founding Fathers did right was to separate religion and politics to say that the state could have no religious preference. That's the clearest and, and surest way to make sure that religious freedom is going to, uh, to be the norm. Uh, but there are plenty of places where Islam does just fine in democracy. Uh, India for instance, uh, the United States, for instance, or even a young democracy like Indonesia that's having some growing pains, but still in Indonesia, Islam has seemed to do okay. And so the Middle East is experiencing twin revolutions. It's experiencing people saying enough with dynastic, autocratic regimes that don't deliver. When Mubarak fell, uh, close to 40% of Egyptian youth were unemployed. So they're not delivering, and they're dynastic, and they're corrupt, and they are not allowing political space. And, of course, in the Middle East, you have a state system that is made up of these artificial states that were sort of drawn on the back of an envelope by the British and the French after uh, the Ottoman Empire collapsed. So Iraq is roughly 60% Shia, and 20% Sunni, and 15% Kurd, and then some others, and it's ruled by a Sunni dictator. Then you get uh, Bahrain, which is 70% Shia, but it's ruled by a, Shia, a Sunni monarch. Sunni monarch. Uh, Saudi Arabia, the 10% of Saudi Arabia is Shia, Sunni monarch. And so these states were held together by monarchs and dictators. Now, in the day when what happens in the village doesn't stay in the village because of social media, so a man in Tunisia is just sick and tired, <coughs> shaken 
down every week by some bureaucrat and in his little business. So he just has had it, he self-immolates. It shows up on social media, goes <coughs> viral, and brings down the government in Egypt. So these regimes, that these places that were held together by monarchs and dictators are not really stable any longer. And underneath, you have the unresolved issues about religion <coughs> and politics. And you have these confessional groups, these you know, Sunni, Shia, Kurds that are sort of all mixed up together. We, I believe <coughs> that the only way that the Middle East ultimately gets to peace is that democratic institutions mm -hmm have to be the only way that people can resolve their differences. Otherwise, somebody's going to oppress somebody else, and that's ultimately the table. I, I do want to clear up one thing, uh, because at the beginning, Bob, you asked about what the US could do. And one reason that I think Americans are somewhat shy or reluctant about democracy promotion is that it's become associated with Iraq and Afghanistan. And one of the things that I wanted to do in this book is to say Iraq and Afghanistan were not democracy promotion. I would not have gone to President Bush and said, use the American military to overthrow Saddam Hussein or overthrow the Taliban so that we can bring democracy to Iraq and Afghanistan. That would have been a misuse of military power. We overthrew those regimes because we had security problems. So in Afghanistan, the Taliban was harboring al-Qaeda after 9-11. In Iraq, Saddam Hussein was a threat in the region. We thought more imminent because we thought he had reconstituted his weapons of mass destruction. But we didn't go to Iraq and Afghanistan to bring uh, democracy any more than we went to Germany to bring democracy when we overthrew Adolf Hitler. Once, however, you've decapitated a totalitarian <laughs> regime, you have to have a view of what comes after. And we believed that Iraq and Afghanistan ought to have a chance toward democracy. They ought to be put on a path toward democracy. But that's not what constitutes democracy promotion. And it's the most stressing case, because if you overthrow a totalitarian regime, there's nothing underneath. When you think about a totalitarian regime, think of Mussolini saying to totalitario. And totalitario meant all within the state nothing outside of the state. Think about Joseph Stalin's Soviet Union. Prokofiev and Shostakovich, great composers, are persecuted for not writing music that's socialist enough. That's what totalitarians do. And so when a totalitarian is overthrown, there's nothing underneath. Most democracy promotion efforts are much less complex and much less stressing than that. Interesting. But let me, if I may, since you talked about Iraq, flash forward. We are where we are. Democracy in Iraq today. Well, Can you I'd comment rather, on that? Yeah, I'd rather be Iraqi than Syrian, uh, for instance, uh, because uh, the Iraqis actually have a prime minister who is weak but accountable. Uh, they have a legislature that actually works and tries to pass budgets, and they have a very free press. They have about 25 different outlets uh, for the press. Uh, their government doesn't actually uh, try to kill them with barrel bombs and chemical weapons. Um, and they are fighting alongside us to try to rid the country of uh, ISIS. Now, they've got a particular existential problem when they defeat ISIS, and they will defeat ISIS. When they defeat ISIS, the question of what constitutes Iraq is going to be on the table. The Kurds may ask for uh, more autonomy, or they may, may ask for a divorce. And one of the reasons that the world has wanted a unified Iraq is because if you start breaking up Iraq, and Shia start adhering to Iran, and Kurds start adhering, some of them to Turkey, some of them, because they're Kurds spread throughout the Middle East. Now the state system in the Middle East won't hold. So that's the problem for Iraq. It's not a problem of democracy, really. It's a problem of whether the state can hold together, given the weak ties between the various uh, religious groups. Interesting. That's a great answer. A little different. What institutions in non-democratic 
countries can assist in democratic promotion? It's a very good question, Bob, because um, authoritarian regimes actually leave space for non-governmental institutions. They're not totalitarians. Totalitarians leave nothing outside of the state. But authoritarians, you'll have universities, for instance, that are not under the state. You'll have civil society in some of them. Uh, you'll have a business community. You might even, as in Tunisia, have labor unions that are not a part of the state. Now, the problem is there's a kind of constant contest with the authoritarian government about how much space they're going to get. And ultimately, authoritarians won't let them into the political space at all. But at that democratic opening, when the authoritarian is about to fall, if those institutions are relatively healthy, as they were in Tunisia, women's groups, the, um, the labor unions, or in Poland, labor unions, now you're going to have a chance that you have some foundations for democratic governance. So one way that you can help in, in democracy promotion is, even under authoritarians, encourage reform that gives space to civil society, to women's groups, to labor unions, to universities, because then you'll have some foundation uh, for, for democracy. Thank you. Um, I didn't expect this to happen, but as some as you know, I'm a salesman. Um, my favorite president, Ronald Reagan, started something called the National Endowment for Democracy in the 80s. And since then, uh, I have lucky enough to be on the board. We have been do doing democracy promotion all over the world. And we have been giving small grants to institutions like you just mentioned. So, yeah. and, uh, and to civil society activists. Yes. Um, and to people who want to organize decent elections. And, and you know what? Democracy promotion is actually really inexpensive. Yes, you're right. Uh, if you ask, they've done surveys, and Americans think that 25% of the federal budget goes to foreign assistance. It's less than 1.5%. And not only is it cost effective, and the, the National Endowment for Democracy is fantastic. And by the way, this is an organization that has an international Republican Institute, and it has a democratic right. arm as well, National Democratic Institute. So uh, it's bipartisan. It has had wide support ever since Ronald Reagan was uh, uh, created it. And it does ter terrific work. Sometimes democracy promotion also is just doing the right thing, standing up for people who are suffering like human rights lawyers who've been jailed or religious objectors, or sometimes just standing for the right thing even if you can't do something. So for 45 years, the United States refused to recognize the forcible incorporation of the Baltic states into the Soviet Union. I was the Soviet specialist at the White House between 89 and 91. Frankly, it didn't get better than being the White House Soviet specialist at the end of the Cold War, so I was pretty lucky. <laughs> but there was this stamp that I had on my desk. And whenever something mentioned uh, Latvia or Estonia, you would stamp it with a stamp that said, the United States does not recognize the forcible incorporation of the Baltic states into the Soviet Union. And when they were finally freed, they never forgot that. And the Baltic states are among our best friends now. So sometimes it's just doing what's right. Right. Thanks. That's great. Um, Russia has dominated US headlines recently. Surprise, surprise. Uh, as an expert on that country, um, I'd like to have you characterized the state of the U.S.-Russian relation affairs, and what should the United States be prioritizing in our relationship with Russia, if I may? Well, Russia has, uh, <laughs> I never thought we'd see so much of Russia, uh, and we're seeing it in every <laughs> way. Let, let me just start by talking a little bit about Vladimir Putin, um, who I know pretty well and spent a lot of time with. and. You know, he kind of liked me at one point because I'm a Russianist. Don't think he probably likes me so much anymore. But he was, you know, he would, we would talk. And one day he says uh, to me, Condi, you know us. Russia has only been great when it's been ruled by great men, like Peter the Great and Alexander the Second. Now, there's a little voice in your head that wants to say, and do you mean Vladimir the Great? <laughs> but you can't do that, right? Can't do that. 
encounter with Catherine the Great? Yeah, I should have said, well, there's also Catherine the Great. He said, yeah, she was pretty good too. Uh, but, but the problem is, um, that's who he thinks he is. He thinks he's uniting the Russian people in greatness. He thinks he's avenging the end of the Cold War. He's called the collapse of the Soviet Union the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. And so, uh, too bad if it means you have to take Crimea or you have to uh, have activities in eastern Ukraine that keeps eastern Ukraine unstable all the time. Uh, too bad if you have to threaten the Swedes along the coast uh, with bomber runs. Uh, too bad if you have to threaten the Baltic states. That's who he is. So that makes U.S.-Russian relations pretty difficult because his view is one that is revisionist and revanchist about the end of the Cold War. Now, we tried really hard to say there were no losers at the end of the Cold War, to integrate Russia into the West, and unfortunately, it's gone the other way. I do think there are some areas in which you can cooperate with the Russians, but you've got to get the ground rules right first, and the ground rules go something like this. Article 5 of the NATO treaty, an attack upon one is an attack upon all, is inviolable. So stop threatening our allies. And I thought that President Obama, by putting troops, uh, rotating troops in Poland and in the Baltic states, sent that message. Second message, uh, stop threatening Europe. What have the Swedes done to you in the last 300 years? Why bomber runs? Uh, leave them alone, and oh, by the way, the United States is still the protector of uh, Europe, and the decision to increase the defense budget is a good signal in that regard. We also need to say to Putin, stop your planes, your pilots, from buzzing our aircraft and buzzing our ships, because sooner or later one of them is going to get shot down. And by the way, there is a way you could send a message to Russian pilots. Uh, our people can do something which is called painting the um, adversary, which means you lock a radar, radar on. The Russian pilot will know. I think there'll be a lot less Russian pilots willing to fly in 10 feet from American ships if we do that. So uh, we've got to set the ground rules. But then Syria, uh, because we didn't act in Syria four or five years ago, the Russians filled the vacuum. They've now put military forces on the ground, diplomacy follows what goes on on the ground, and they have the whip hand. We can't make Bashar al-Assad go away, even though President Obama said he had to go. They can. And I'm not sure that ultimately they want to be associated with Bashar al-Assad. You know, they wanted to uh, secure a Russian position in the Middle East, they've done that. They wanted to secure their bases, they've done that. They didn't want Assad to fall suddenly because they thought you would have a Libya. They've done that. But when Rex Tillerson went to Moscow, just before he was about to go to Moscow, he said that the Russians were either about, you know, because they negotiated the uh, chemical weapons deal, said they were either incompetent or they were lying. I thought, wow, that was rough. Not sure I would have said that on my way to the Kremlin. And um, as I was saying earlier, maybe you shouldn't drink or eat anything uh, in the Kremlin once you've done that, uh, especially if it has a little bit of a metal, metallic taste, you know, be careful. Uh, but he was absolutely right. So saying to the Russians, are you sure you want to pin your hopes on Assad? Let's end this war. We're going to have to end the war through Moscow. That's one place we should cooperate. The other place is North Korea. You know, we've got this kind of... Um, slightly unhinged, reckless leader, um, Kim Jong-un, who uh, has nuclear weapons uh, and is about to attach them to missiles that are capable, maybe, I don't know what President Trump's being told, maybe three years, maybe five years. No president of the United States is going to allow that to happen. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to work with the Chinese who do have some influence with the North Koreans, but the Chinese have never wanted to squeeze the North Koreans because they worry about the collapse of the regime. And they worry about a long border, they worry about refugees, they worry we might take advantage and try to unify the Koreas if North Korea fails. They see what happened with the Germans, for instance. And so they're saying to the Chinese, though, that's now not your choice, right? Because 
if you don't do something about the North Koreans, we'll have to do something. And the options for us are not very good. Uh, you know, military options with Seoul sitting within just a few miles of his tens of thousands of artillery pieces, he'll cause a lot of civilian casualties. So the best option is to try to get the Chinese to act, and I think that's what the administration is trying to do. But the Russians could also help, because if a missile can reach Alaska, it can reach Vladivostok. And they must not like what they're seeing from North Korea either. You stepped on my next question, which was North Korea. But, and I've jokingly said, between South Korea and China and the United States, we could buy all the North Koreans a home in Beverly Hills. <laughs> don't, don't be worried. But, <laughs> but um, I mean, don't we have to put immense pressure on the Ch I mean, I don't understand what the Chinese are thinking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ultimately, we would make it, a, it probably is now a nuclear-free zone. Yeah. We um, ultimately could withdraw our troops. Yeah, that, um, uh, it, we, we have to convince them that they don't have an option at this point, or we will act. We also have to convince them we won't take advantage. Yeah. You know, um, I, I might even say the North Korea, to the uh, Chinese at this point, look, you, you take care of North Korea. Okay? We're, we're not going to ask any questions. Just do it. But the Chinese will tell you that Kim Jong-un is not his father. All right? I tried to negotiate when Kim Jong-il was there. And they will tell you he's more reckless and that they have less influence. Now, there's some evidence for this because uh, this is the guy who reached into Malaysia and killed his half-brother with VX and his half-brother was under Chinese protection. So uh, they may not have as much influence. We better hope they have a lot of influence, because that's really the only way that we get this result. Yeah. One, one right. sense, I sense that the Chinese are getting a little tougher, because the North Koreans are starting to scream at the Chinese, and that's probably a good sign. Good. A little prayer for that. Yes, that's a tough absolutely. one. Uh, w one more question, then I'll turn it over to the audience. Uh, we seem to be in an era of citizen journalists, you know, handheld cameras, mobile phones, web blogs, tweets, uh, social networks. How do you think this might change democracy, if I may well, ask? Well, at, at one about. level, uh, the ability to mobilize, to mobilize across borders, to uh, shine a light on what happens in Iran or what happens, those, those are all good things for democracy. But thus far, Technology and social media have been better at tearing things down than they have been at building things up. Hmm. And um, one of the problems with social media and the speed of information today is democracy takes time. Uh, it takes time for governments that are democratic to deliver. You know, if you want just out and out efficiency, then yeah, authoritarians can be more efficient. The only problem is if you're going to be omnipotent, you'd better be omniscient too. And so authoritarians can act, but they're going to make bigger mistakes. So the Chinese had a great idea. They were worried about population explosion. So they imposed this thing called the one-child policy. And they did it quickly, and they did it eff effectively. Funny thing happens when you mess with nature. Now 30 million Chinese men don't have mates. Because out in the villages, if you want only going to have one child, you wanted a boy, a lot of girls disappeared. So authoritarians can act quickly, but they make more mistakes. Democracy takes time for you know, the compromises that have to be made. And I'm watching our own system where uh, you, it's some congressperson is out with a microphone in his face before he's had a chance to even talk to his colleagues about what he might do. Uh, not to mention the <coughs> propensity of people to tweet, which is not really helping democracy um, greatly either. So um, I think that social media has its benefits, but it, it, democracy doesn't work quickly. And uh, you know, the kind of uh, on-demand um, social media world makes it hard to get things done. Interesting. OK, we have three speedy people on their feet with microphones. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, I'll start with this lady right here in the aisle. And would you please uh, just state your name and keep your question brief, if you could. Uh, my name is Suzanne Baj. I'm with the Syrian Institute for Progress. Uh, Madam Secretary, you had mentioned that for the future of Syria, we need to uh, deal through Russia. How can we trust some people like Putin and Assad who operates like mafia? They had used 
every single weapon in Syria, from barrel bombs to chemical weapons, and now we hear about crematory. Didn't we re hear ab uh, about the history? Why are we repeating the same mistake happened in the past, and what's gonna happen next? First of all, let me say that had we acted four or five years ago, we wouldn't be in this situation, right? And sometimes when you don't act, you lose options. And now we have few options. Now, we could, um, if we were, if the American people were willing, we could try and arm the Syrian uh, rebellion. I would probably still do that. I think that we have done a good thing in striking the Syrian air bases after the chemical weapons attack. I think President Trump did the right thing there. And maybe we've delivered a message to the Russians, at least, that there are some things that are unacceptable. And when I say go through Moscow, I don't mean go through Moscow to keep Assad in power. I mean try to convince Putin that Assad is not their best long-term play. Because unfortunately, we don't have the leverage because we didn't act. Diplomacy follows what happens on the ground, not the other way around. Mm. And I know for a fact that I think Secretary Kerry and, uh, and before him, Secretary Clinton and a number of others wanted to do something more, um, more decisive in Syria in arming the Free Syrian Army before there was infiltration by terrorist groups, in arming them when Assad was really on his back foot. That we should have done. And we will live forever with the stain of not having acted and the hundreds of thousands of Syrians who died as a result and the, the millions of Syrians who were displaced. It's a humanitarian nightmare now and we have to find a way to end it. And I, I think, by the way, the Iranians and the Russians don't have the same identical interest here. I think the Iranians want Assad. They want Assad because, by the way, Assad assures their, um, it's their lanes into Lebanon through which they supply Hezbollah because we cut off the southern route after the 2006 uh, war. They now use the route through Syria. So they want Assad. But the Russians might, maybe they don't want Assad in the long run. And so um, I think we need to find a way to end the war and that's what I mean. Uh, ultimately, Assad can't govern Syria. Can't happen. But how he leaves, I think, is really the issue now, and we unfortunately don't have the leverage to do it. Thank you. Uh, let's get someone over here on the right. Right here, the gentleman, first gentleman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jordan Reimer. I work for the NYPD. Just following up on that question, then. It seems we did intervene in Libya, as you mentioned, and that turned into a bit of a chaotic vacuum. And why do you think that if we had intervened in Syria in 2012, it would have turned out any differently uh, than Libya turned out? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we intervened in Libya very suddenly um, on a kind of humanitarian impulse about what Gaddafi maybe was about to do. Um, I was not inside, so I can't you know, I, I'm quite aware of what you do and do not know from the outside. But I might have tried, given Gaddafi's efforts to get back into the international system, to say to Gaddafi, don't do that or we will act. The second thing is that Libya really isn't a country. You know, it's a group of tribes. And if you were going to intervene, you had to have some plan for what you did after and we didn't. Now you can criticize the plans in Iraq, but at least in Iraq we had more than 100,000 American forces on the ground, and we had allies that we were trying to build a government with. In Libya you had nothing of the sort, and so I think we had the worst of all worlds in Libya. We had no real domestic forces to work with in Libya, we had no foreign forces. It was basically an air campaign in Libya. And it was basically a group of tribes that began fighting each other almost immediately. Syria, I think, was a very different situation. I think there actually was in Syria the chance that you had a free Syrian army that actually could have been an ally of the uh, United States. And I would not, by the way, have tried to use our ground troops in Syria. 
I'm talking about uh, using air power, using safe zones, uh, finding ways to take out his air force so that he couldn't uh, use it against his own people. And in Syria, there was a moment at which you had people in the regime who looked like they were ready to defect. So you had a very different set of circumstances in Syria uh, that I think you might, have, you might have done better in Syria than we did in Libya. Uh, gentleman back here on the left, on my left. Thank you very much, uh, Brian Goldsmith. I was curious your reaction to President Trump's meeting with Lavrov and Kislyak in the Oval Office, during which he apparently shared this extraordinarily sensitive Israeli intelligence, as well as called the uh, former director of the FBI a nut job. Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, if the second happened, that's uh, unfortunate in the extreme. Um, look, I know Jim Comey, and um, I, I think he's really served the country well. And uh, if, you, if you were going to fire Jim Comey, you might have actually called him and said, you know, I no longer uh, need your services, and maybe let Jim Comey then say, I resign. No, there are ways to do this. And uh, this was not elegant, to say the least. Um, and uh, I don't know what he said to the Russians about Jim Comey, but. Um, you know, the, the, the Russians are not your friends, and uh, you wouldn't talk that way around, around your friends. I don't know why you would among your adversaries. So if that was said, it was unfortunate. But there is so much he said, she said, they said, that I don't know what to make of these meetings anymore. As to the intelligence point, you know, on this I trust H.R. McMaster. He says nothing inappropriate happened. Right? Now, presidents can declassify intelligence on the spot. Um, and I, as I understand it, it was intelligence about passenger aircraft and laptops. And maybe the president felt an impulse to tell the Russians this because of dangers to Russian aircraft. So that would be a decent motive by which to do it. If it is true that he didn't know that it had come from a sensitive source, that's a failure of the process in the White House. Because what you would do is you would say, when a president sees something, Mr. President, this is from a very uh, delicate, allied source. You should never speak of it uh, outside of this room. Uh, maybe that didn't happen. And it says to me that they have a larger problem, which is that the White House processes are not doing what White Houses have to do, what White House processes have to do. Every president has has weaknesses and every president has strengths. It is the job of the White House staff to enhance the strengths and minimize the weaknesses. And I think you're seeing a White House that's not really operating very effectively. Now, as I understand it, the Israelis were either not upset or decided not to be upset. <laughs> Maybe they just decided not to be upset. But, um, you know, I have to take McMaster's word for it, and he was in the meeting, um, that it was not something that was inappropriate. Um, it certainly probably shouldn't have happened, but these things do, they do happen. Um, you know, intelligence secrets, sensitive intelligence secrets get revealed all the time, unfortunately. Uh, sometimes even by presidents, unwittingly. Uh, would you be offended if I called the White House tonight and suggested you as Chief of Staff? Oh, yeah, really offended. Okay. <laughs> that that uh, might there, be the end of our friendship, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> All right. There's a gentleman on my right, right down here, about halfway, who's had his hand up. Come, come all the way down there. There he goes. Thank you. Uh, Richard Knapp speaking. S Secretary Rice, um, speaking of slightly unhinged, reckless, increasingly authoritarian presidents in the Western Hemisphere. And of course, I speak of Nicolas Maduro of Venezuela. Um, I wanted to ask you, there's an example of a country with a long democratic tradition that's moving quite desperately and miserably in a direction that started over a decade ago and has gotten increasingly bad, a, a longtime ally of the US, 
that where people are now starting to get killed as they oppose the president and get tried in military courts. What should the U.S. do? I mean, I must tell you, I'm, I sort of, at this point in my life, I kind of like the Allende solution in, in another place, but I realize that's unlikely. Yeah. So I just wanted <laughs> yeah. to ask your advice on that. Well, thanks for asking about Venezuela because it's, it's uh, not at the top of people's minds and it should be. Uh, this was a middle income country just a decade ago. And it's now a country where people can't get medicine and can't get food and are crowding the borders of the other Andean states in search of food. Just imagine that. And uh, Maduro is like Chavez without charm, okay? He's just, uh, he, our he's, brains. He, our brains, <laughs> right. And the problem is that you are right about what's happened to the democratic institutions. I mean, Chavez really eroded, you know, an independent judiciary, free press, universities, all to his Chavista revolution. But sometimes, one thing that this book really has convinced me of as I was doing research on various cases, is sometimes there's just a little life left in the institutions underneath. And something sparks them to come back to life. So I know enough Venezuelans who could leave the country but haven't because they're still counting on the ability to take their country mm. back. And we can't do this on our own, in large part because of our own history in Latin America. But I don't understand the Organization of American States, and I don't understand the Latin Americans, and I don't understand why Brazil and Chile and others are not all over Maduro to have a transition to elections in a couple of years, because it will take that long to rebuild uh, moderate forces, so that you can get this man, this cra half crazy, person who is just brutal out of the region. Now, part of it is Cuba. The, the, Cuba has, uh, the fingerprints of the Cubans are all over the Chavista revolution. But Cuba's got enough of its own problems at this point that I'm not sure it can be a real force in Latin America any longer. So my view is that in, a, in conjunction with the Organization of American States, and there's a good uh, executive director who's trying to, to do some of this, they really ought to be, where I, you know, Uruguay, for instance, Frank. I mean, these countries ought to be all over Maduro to end this tragedy in Venezuela. Because if somebody doesn't find a peaceful way out of this, you're going to have an, a violent revolution in Venezuela. And if the Andean states think they've got problems now, you just wait until that happens. So uh, it needs to be top of mind, uh, but we need the Latin Americans to help. Good answer. Um, lady way in the back, in black. Hello, Dr. Rice. I'm Candace Chen. I'm a local um, SME. Wanted to say it's um, so nice to have you here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. You're an inspiration to young women everywhere. Um, also wanted to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. And uh, my question has to do with China. What is your prediction about China? Should the U.S. have a role, and or what role, in facilitating democracy in China, or should we just let nature take its course? Yeah, thank thank you. you. Well, I do think nature's going to take its course. Um, and um, I, I look, the Chinese government is uh, depending on the fact that it has legitimacy based on prosperity. It lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. It's no longer a backward country. It's a remarkable place. It's, you know, Alibaba is the, the toast of, uh, of uh, the tech world and so forth and so on. But you can only count on prosperity for legitimacy so long because people's expectations keep growing. And the economic model that the Chinese used to get there heavy investment from the government, low cost of labor in the international community, international economy, um, very strong export driven. It's run out of steam. And they know that they need to reform toward a more market-based economy. But you know, a funny thing happens when you start unleashing all those market forces. You can't really control that from the top down. And so now there's an a, a uncomfortable fit 
between an authoritarian Chinese political system and an economic system that's changing quite dramatically underneath. I think in time you're going to see uh, that China has to start to make some moves toward liberalization and the question is will the government be smart enough to see it. So far Xi Jinping has done just the opposite. He's tried to crush dissent. But my Chinese students and friends tell me that um, you, know, you can try as much as you want to block the internet. They find ways around it. I was recently at Tsinghua University and I gave a speech and I decided I wasn't going to give a speech this time about US-China relations. I was going to speak as if I were speaking to students at Stanford. So I talked about finding your passion and trying things that are hard and so forth and so on. So now it's Q&A. &A. And a uh, student raises uh, his hand. So why do I have to take literature? I'm an engineer, right? Uh, whoa, okay, where'd that come from? <coughs> uh, next question. What if your parents don't like the major you've chosen? I thought, is this China or is this Palo Alto, right? <laughs> so something's also happening among youth. And the strains and stresses in this system, China had 186,000 riots last year. You know why? Some peasant has his land expropriated by a party chief out in the, in the provinces and a developer, and there are no courts, so he and his friends riot. So Chinese government people have said to me, you know, we actually need independent courts. Well, once you start getting independent courts, now it's not too mm -hmm. far to an independent judiciary. So what's the role of the United States in this? I would say it's much like what I said about the Baltic states, not recognizing the forcible incorporation. Continuing to speak for people who are voiceless, human rights advocates, people who are religious fighters for religious freedom. Continuing to say that we hope China reforms toward a soft landing because we don't need 1.4 billion people in revolt. But I think if we, you can do it respectfully, but if we take our eye off the ball here. One day, people in China are going to get their rights. And we will have been on the wrong side of that history. And that's not healthy. Let's try a couple of people on the left. Uh, maybe the gentleman way in the back and then get the gentleman in the front. Way in the back. Way in the back. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here. Michael Camunia is I'm a privilege of being on the board of the Pacific Council. We're delighted to have you. Uh, quick two-part question. The Trump administration and surprisingly much of the Republican establishment has w moved away from uh, the historic commitment to free trade. And trade, as you know, economic statecraft is the other side of diplomacy. Yeah. I'm curious if you would comment on those dynamics and how you think, you know, what you, how you assess the U.S.'s failure to lead at least recently on those issues. And part of that, of course, includes, which is the second my, part of my question, the president's decision to pick a fight with Mexico and to threaten to withdraw from NAFTA and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, next week, by coincidence, the Pacific Council will be taking a delegation to Mexico City for okay. three days, seeing the highest leaders in Mexico. And I'm curious if you could just maybe give your views on the fallout from this trade uh, change of policy and specifically as it relates to Mexico? Sure, well, the, the anti-trade sentiment in the Trump administration um, is a part of a broader uh, anti-trade sentiment as a part of a kind of a globalization backlash, right? And uh, it was telling that in our election, Donald Trump wasn't for trade, Bernie Sanders wasn't for trade, and Hillary Clinton, who was the secretary who actually helped to negotiate the Trans-Pacific Partnership wasn't for trade. And that says that they're responding to something. And what is it? Well, it is this anti-globalization backlash. And I think in order to get back to a place where we really are comfortable with trade again and, um, and not protectionism and the like, we've got to deal with the basic causes of this move toward populism or this attraction to populism. Uh, the, f the fact is that there are a lot of people who are not doing very well. And uh, they are desperate and they're angry 
and they were looking for somebody to give them a reason for why they weren't doing very well. And populists give you easy reasons. They tell you it's the immigrants, it's the Mexicans, it's the Chinese. If you're on the left, it's the big banks. And of course, we all know that that's not why people aren't doing very well. It's changes in economy, automation, and a whole bunch of other reasons that people with low skills are not doing very well. So you've got to address that problem in order to get back to a place where people are going to be comfortable again advocating for free trade. And that's a human, uh, a human um, potential problem. And we've got it, you know, we've got to have no more third graders who can't read, and we've got to do something about 18-year-olds who can't find a job. Um, you've got to do something about 35-year-olds who need to be retrained. And, Help and help us with the 50-year-old who is opioid addicted and uh, out of the labor market, right? Now, I know that people were cheering when Macron won in France. Uh, I was too. But let's not be mistaken. The populists have changed the conversation so that even centrists now won't talk about free trade. Even centrists won't talk about immigration. The British are talking about industrial policy. That hasn't happened since Maggie Thatcher finally put it out of its misery. And so um, I think we've got a really big task against them. It's, it's not going to be enough to just say, you know, free trade really is good. I believe it really is good. But for a lot of people, there really were losers, not from free trade, but from the broad changes in the economy. There's one other thing. Identity is a part of this, too. You know, I have students at Stanford, my business school students, born in Brazil, um, went to college in London, first job was in Shanghai, now they're an MBA at Stanford, next job will be in Dubai. And they move easily around the world. You know, it's just not a, not a problem. The people in this room, I would bet you were all part of the global elite. We move easily around the world. But most people never live more than 25 miles from where they were born. And there was bound to be a culture clash, particularly because global elites got very self-satisfied. Global elites started denigrating the values of people who weren't part of the global elite, laughing at them, putting them down, saying they were attached to their guns and their religion. And you know what? They got mad. And a friend of mine called our election the, do you hear me now? election. <laughs> so it's not going to be enough to defend the liberal order, which I believe has needs defending. You're going to have to address these underlying problems as well. And uh, as to Mexico, you know, it, somebody should tell people that, you know, net immigration from Mexico the last two years was zero. Because the problem isn't illegal immigration from Mexico, it's coming up from Central America where people are fleeing the violence of the drug trade. I'm hoping that the bark is worse than the bite on NAFTA because the outlines of what they want to renegotiate are not really that dramatic. And so maybe people are realizing, and you know, people say all kinds of things in campaigns. Okay, on day one I will. Well, on day one they don't because they realize it's actually really hard and you can't change things that quickly. And so this may be one of those that if we can calm down the rhetoric and if the Mexicans can give us a mulligan, a kind of do-over, um, we might be okay because I actually think um, they're very quickly going to learn that you can't tear up NAFTA. On, on the day after 9-11, we'd closed the border with Canada. And within hours, nobody could make a car in Detroit because the supply lines were unified throughout North America. So uh, sooner or later, people will figure that out. Don't mess with the car dealers. I think there's, <laughs> come on, there's a gentleman right up here in front, about three rows on, the, on my left side, right here. Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, great. Madam Secretary, thank you for your service. I'm Danny Schein. Um, I'm very, very disturbed by a president who's been there 115 days and the comments relating to every piece of fake news 
which he is a proponent of from his own point of view, it seems to me that most free societies exist because the press is very diligent in, in what they do. But when you have someone who consistently puts himself in a position to play a role where <clears throat> he believes that whatever the press is saying is not true, after a while, I think it begins to wear down our society. And I'm wondering what you could suggest could be done in order to protect this basic freedom that we have. Well, thank you. Well, I think the, um, I'm very confident in America's institutions to handle just about anything. And um, the press is going to keep reporting, and they're going to keep digging, and they're going to keep being talking heads. And um, in fact, the more that this kind of tarantulas in a bottle relationship unfolds, uh, you know, they're feeding off him, he's feeding off them. Uh, the more I think the American people are going to tune out of that piece of it and actually go to get news where they can, can get it. So I'm actually pretty confident that free press will not be eroded. Um, I am concerned that about something else, which is that I am concerned that our news, our information has become so atomized that we no longer have the same basis of knowledge about anything. So I'm going to date myself. When I was a kid, we watched the Huntley Brinkley Report every night. Some people watched Walter Cronkite. Some people watched Howard K. Smith. But we had basically the same Tet Offensive, the same Civil Rights Movement, the same Moonshot, the same Kennedy assassination. We watched it. Now I can go to my blogger. I can go to my cable news channel. I can go to my aggregator, my websites. I never actually encounter anybody who thinks differently. I live in a little echo chamber, right, where everybody thinks like I do. And so when I now encounter people who don't think like I do, I think they're either venal or stupid. And that worries me even more than the questions, issues about free press. Because I think our press will always be free. But it is becoming really hard. You know, I've, it's been a long time since I saw a headline in the New York Times that was not an editorial. So we've got that problem, too. Now, with the president, uh, you know, I hope that he's going to, somebody is going to say to him, uh, Mr. President, you're, I know you're not accustomed to what's happening to you. Right? So when you've been governor of a state, or a senator, or when you've been a high-ranking official, or you've been an ambassador in a country, you're quite accustomed to getting up in the morning looking at a news article and thinking, I didn't say that, or what jerk said that about me? And you get mad, and you've got That's steam true. coming out of your ears. But you take a deep breath, and you count to 10, and you then ignore it, right? Because you can't get upset every time. Because the criticism is relentless when you're in those jobs. It's relentless. When we'd get bad press, somebody in the Bush administration would get bad press, we'd say, welcome to the NFL. Right? <laughs> because that's what it was like. You were like a quarterback with linebackers trying to take your head off on every play. Right? I don't think he's ever experienced this, where people are constantly, constantly after you. And so he reacts, now they react. And then he reacts, and then they react. And it spirals and spirals and spirals. And so uh, we are in kind of a bad place in, in this regard. I agree completely. And I mean, the country's just exhausted, right? It's sort of like, whoa, do I have to watch the news even tonight? But, um, but I do think the, I'm not, I'm not worried about the free press. I think we will, we will have that um, for a long, long time. Sadly, I'm going to take just one more question. I'm looking for, oh, Ambassador Schnabel, of yes. course. <laughs> Sorry. Very quickly. Wait, wait, look. Uh, Give a chance Mike, to the Mike, lady. Mike. Everyone wants to hear you, Mr. Ambassador. <laughs> Not everyone. <laughs> <laughs> wait, what do I do now? 
And you didn't even this, need a is mic. Is this a colleague? <laughs> <laughs> Madam Secretary, so the question is very quickly, uh, Assange comment and a Ron deal. Yeah. Assange uh, should be put under a jail someplace. Um, it is, um, you know, I would take Assange and Snowden and all of them and, uh, you know, it, it, the, the problem, and it, it's not just WikiLeaks, you know, the problem is people suddenly believe that they have a right to expose other people's secrets, business, um, intelligence, uh, and I don't mean, you know, making a mistake, I mean deliberately exposing. and. Uh, that's really broken down in ways that are very dangerous. Uh, and so uh, I, I understand when people feel that something's wrong and they want to expose it, but I don't really like this run to the press first. You know, you have plenty of, um, you have ombudsman people, you can go to the Congress, there are lots of ways to get heard. Um, just going to the press, and Assange has been the principal beneficiary of the foible uh, of human beings to to use this this method, uh, the Iran deal uh, not one I would have signed. Um, it it's not so much the nuclear piece wasn't so awful. Um, got a little bit of constraint on their programs. Got inspectors on the ground, although I rather suspect that they're inspectors who won't find anything because the Iranians are not going to cheat where you're looking, right? Uh, but what I really disliked about this deal was what I think the Saudis disliked and the Israelis disliked, and it was giving the Iranians assets to make trouble in the Middle East. And the, the fact is, I was the one who created the P5 plus one, so I didn't mind negotiating with the Iranians. And the Obama administration had done quite well in getting very tough sanctions on the Iranians, and they were desperate. So they come to the table, and then suddenly we're more desperate for a deal than they are. And I think the deal is hmm. not a good deal. I wouldn't tear it up because it's not worth the upset with our allies. But um, I would uh, wait until they cheat and they're going to cheat. And so um, I'd be looking for a way out of the release of the assets. I, I think it's a wow. problem. Condi, thank you very thank much. You. That was fantastic. <laughs> He was fantastic. <laughs>